advisory committee, um, and I know several people from the advisory committee, uh, advisory board, I should say, are here tonight, so uh, a warm welcome. And uh, one of those is Professor Mike Kelly, who's head of the Centre for Public Health Excellence at NICE. Um, he's a sociologist by background, and also um, his team have uh, published last month uh, NICE's guidance on behaviour change. Thank you, Susan, and it's a really great pleasure to be here to mark the, the start of something terribly important, I think, for UCL and more broadly. I was asked recently by a journalist, okay, you're a public health guy, what are the really key problems that we should be turning our attention to? And I said, well, there are two. We're in the grip of a, a pizza movement. On the one hand, from preventable, non-communicable disease, and on the other hand, from an epidemic, or potential epidemic, of communicable disease. The thing which both have in common is the fact that, to a significant degree, they're driven almost entirely by behaviour. Now, first off, with respect to the epidemic of non-communicable disease, what I have in mind here are the things that have, in passing, already been mentioned and they relate to the preventable diseases associated with smoking, associated with lack of physical activity, associated with poor diet, um, and associated with attendant obesity. And together, that lethal cocktail um, drive forward the epidemics of non-communicable disease, not just in this country, but globally. It's also very important to note that those diseases are not spread randomly across the population, but rather they cluster together, both in terms of the behaviours themselves and, of course, the outcomes of those behaviours in the, what, what my colleagues on the clinical side of NICE refer to as multi-morbidities. They kick in younger, if you're poorer, if you're disadvantaged, um, to the degree that, um, in certain parts of Scotland, uh, the biomarkers are already present in many people by the time they're in their late 20s. So this patterning of human behaviour, um, patterning of individual human behaviour, but patterning at the population level too, drives forward some of the most important determinants of our health inequalities. Now over on the other side, the other part of the pincer, uh, lay infectious disease. Now of course infectious diseases are primarily understood in terms of the biological action. But the crisis that we're facing with respect to infectious disease um, resides in the problem of antimicrobial resistance. Um, the development of the bugs in such a way that they are, are, are resistant to uh, the staple uh, defense that we've used for the last 60 years or more, um, the antibiotics and antivirals. And we've created, through our own actions, through the behavior of us as consumers of medicine, demanding treatments from our doctors which are often inappropriate, by the prescribing behaviour of doctors themselves, by the use of antibiotics, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics across populations um, for incidents that probably don't need them, um, and of course in the actions of the veterinary and farming communities um, worldwide. Uh, Dave Sally Davis published a book just before Christmas uh, called The Drugs Don't Work. Um, I, I tried to get it on Amazon, but all that kept coming up was a song by the same name. Um, <laughs> eventually, I did manage to get the, get the book. And it's, it's, it's a salutary warning, primarily aimed at politicians, so they get the issue. Um, but of course, the underlying thing that drives all of that um, is, are the behaviours of the various groups that I've outlined. I've been working at the interface of the Academy policy, politicians, and government uh, since I gave up being an academic about 13 years ago. And a number of lessons, particularly lessons about um, behaviour and behaviour change, have emerged or have become apparent with almost every interaction I have with figures in that world of policy and politics and government. And that is that every so often, a new minister gets it. Yep, the penny drops it's all about behaviour, stupid. 
And if we can put that right, we can solve all of these problems. Or rather, if we can understand and unlock the drivers of behaviour change, then we will be able to bring about the kinds of change that will lead to the end of the epidemic associated with type 2 diabetes and so on and so on and so forth. And even possibly uh, the potential threats from antimicrobial resistance. But then what tends to happen is the argument collapses. Because there are about half a dozen key errors that I encounter certainly on a weekly basis in my dealings uh, with authorities. And they go roughly like this. First, behaviour change is common sense. Not science, it's common sense. That if we would only do what was good for us, or we would only do what someone else determines is good for us, then everything would be okay. When you look at this closely, the argument that it's common sense has a fantastic redolence with Victorian arguments about virtue and morality. Because if only those grubby people in the East End of London had done what was good for them and had done the morally correct thing in the 1850s and 60s and 70s, we wouldn't have had all that terrible stuff that went on down in the East End. But of course, it's not common sense. As Susan said, it's a science um, and it's a, it's a discipline, a range of disciplines that come into play. Second error. It's about getting the message across. Now, what that message is, again, is a mixture of morality, common sense, um, what's good for you, or what I think is good for you, um, and that notion that if we could only somehow get the message in a form that everyone would understand, perhaps with some adverts, perhaps with some leaflets, perhaps with a television campaign, all would be well. Well, of course, public information is an important part of public education, uh, or our education more generally, our literacy more generally, about health matters. But we have a long, long history, uh, going back to the days of the First World War and campaigns to stop the troops in France getting what was rather colourfully called in those days venereal disease. Um, going back to those days, educating the troops, getting the message across, which shows, at best, the limited levels of success of that as approach. Third error, that knowledge drives behaviour in some simple, linear fashion. It doesn't. Uh, knowledge is an important component of behaviour, for sure, but there's all sorts of other things that are going on, um, which the disciplines of psychology, sociology, anthropology and economics have spent the last 150 years articulating. Third error, uh, no, not third, fourth. <laughs> I, I've lost count. Anyway, next error is that people behave rationally. That given the right information, given the right circumstances, given the right something or other, they will weigh up using a kind of intellectual calculus and come up with the right answer. Which actually usually means the answer I think they should come up with rather than from a kind of empowered position of the individual. Of course, we do behave rationally some of the time. Uh, we are, all of us, creatures uh, who make decisions. We weigh up the pros and cons of future potential behaviours and act accordingly. But we're also creatures driven by responses automatically to the environment. We tend to take the easy way out very often. We're creatures of habit. We're hardwired to do the easy or lazy thing rather than that which is rational. But then there's another error, which is the opposite one, which is people just behave irrationally. Well, that's clearly not true either. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they do things um, which are self-harming, either in the short or long run. But you can't construct an account of these things solely on the basis of those simple ideas. And the last error is that we can predict these things. If we know enough at time point T1, about the situation or the person or their psychological makeup or their sociological background or their economic circumstances and we do something to them, we can predict with certainty what is going to happen in the future. In fact, we can predict some of what's going to happen in the future, but not all of what's going to happen in the future. 
I am planning a paper, who knows whether I'll ever write it, but it's called, It Is Rocket Science Stupid. <laughs> it's really difficult, this stuff. And that, of course, is why um, people like Susan, the launch of this center, are so critical. Because we need, you, you wouldn't, you know, put it, if we wanted to redesign brain surgery, the political response wouldn't be, ah, easy. It's brain surgery. It's all, all in your head. You wouldn't rely upon some kind of common sense understanding of neuroanatomy. And likewise, we shouldn't rely on some common sense understanding of human behaviour. If you look at the new NICE guidance came out a few weeks ago, it tries um, to get to the state of the art of the knowledge where we are now, but in the full understanding that there's a long way to go. That's why, of course, um, I, I'm so delighted to both be here tonight to see the launch of this centre and look forward to a rich uh, scientific, intellectual uh, and behavioural set of changes uh, that will derive from it.